When you try to sink, you float. When you hold your breath, you lose it. And when I tell you not to think of this purple elephant with a mohawk, you do. Watts calls this the backwards law. In this video, we will explore the backwards law in relation to man's quest for psychological security and his efforts to find spiritual and intellectual certainty in religion and philosophy. But I warn you, what I'm about to share may have you end up more confused than if you didn't watch this video at all. But I encourage you to rewatch the parts you don't understand so that you can come closer to peace with the absurd. This is a book summary of The Wisdom of Insecurity by Alan Watts. It's time to watch the next part of this video. Chapter 1 The Age of Anxiety Prevalent traditions like having a family life, social life, economic order, trust in government, and religion have all dwindled. The decay of belief in these traditions spawned from the intellect of the great scientific and philosophical thinkers of our time. Consequently, modern life has become an existential quagsire. I mean, I mean quagmire. An awkward complex or hazardous situation. Or as Watts puts it, our age is one of frustration, anxiety, agitation, and addiction to dope. Somehow we must grab what we can while we can and drown out the realization that the whole thing is futile and meaningless. Belief in anything is an attempt to hang on to life, but to understand life, you can't hang on to it. Trying to hang on to it is like trying to go to sleep. The more you try, the less success you have. Watts says, faith on the other hand is an unreserved opening of the mind to the truth, whatever it may turn out to be. Belief clings, but faith lets go. Chapter two. Pain and time. Let me ask you a question. If you could start life all over again, would you rather be a human or a cat? Meow. You chose a cat, didn't you? Because a cat seems devoid of problems, operating on instinct. It appears to live in the present moment, enjoying the free snacks that its fellow human feeds it. The key message in this chapter is that what separates us from a cat's experience of the world is our ability to conceive the past and the future. It causes us tremendous pain. Watts calls this dread. It's what fuels our desire for meaning. Chapter 3. The Great Stream God or the universe can't be explained in words. Words are symbols, not reality. Words are like coins for real things. Words represent X, but are not X. Just like money represents Y, but is not Y. The more we try to live in the world of words, the more we feel isolated and alone. The more all the joy and the liveliness of things is exchanged for mere certainty and security. Religion and science are also symbols. There is a Joe Rogan episode with Firas Sahabi in which they are debating science. Firas tries to get through to Joe that science can't make sense of the universe. The conversation went something like this. Fira says, Let's say I'm about to flip a coin. Joe goes, Mm-hmm. Now, you're going to tell me it's probably going to land on heads or tails. Mm-hmm. Do you know that logically? Or is it based on your history with flipping coins? Well, both. I'm going to argue that you don't know it logically. You only know it based on your past history. This is going to get weird, so pay attention. Erase everything you've ever known about coins. You've never seen a coin before. Now say that I flip a coin and it turns into a butterfly. And you go, oh, that's cool. And then say I flip that coin 100 times and it turns into a butterfly. On the 101st time, you'll be like, I bet it turns into a butterfly. That's how we express science. So science is the faith that the future will behave like the past. It's only a name for a pattern we've observed in nature. So it's not that A causes B, it's just that we see A, and then we see B. So the only way to make sense of cosmic absurdity is not words, religion, or science, but to plunge into it, move with it, and join the dance. Chapter 4. The Wisdom of the Body Look at this anagram. The idea is to rearrange the letters to form the word. So you can summon your brain power for hours trying to rearrange and unscramble it. Or just try looking at it right now with a relaxed mind, and the answer will likely come to you with little effort.
let us know in the comments if you got it. So the yogis seem to be in tune with the wisdom of their bodies, whereas the West is obsessed with thinking. This bias for brain over body is demonstrable by man's slavery to clocks. Think about it. Isn't it absolutely crazy that you rely on a man-made clock to tell you when to eat, sleep, work, and relax? The real clock is the sun, the moon, and your bodily intuition. Watts also asks, why do we sit on toilets? What the hell are we doing? Why are we disrupting our digestive systems? This is crazy. And why do we interfere with childbirth? Finally, Watts says the brain is clever enough to see the vicious circle which it has made for itself, but it can do nothing about it. Seeing that it is unreasonable to worry does not stop worrying. Rather, you worry the more at being unreasonable. The brain can only assume its proper behavior when consciousness is doing what it is designed for. Not writhing and whirling and squirming to get out of present experience, but being effortlessly aware of it. Chapter 5. On Being Aware Modern man is on a deluded quest for security. Work your way up that corporate ladder and then one day, everything will be fine. You'll have enough money, you'll have social status among your peers, and you'll finally be able to live a comfortable life. Desiring security is the same as desiring things to never change. Desiring things to never change is to resist what is. And to resist what is, is to suffer. Why are we still here? Just to suffer. To suffer is to be watching this YouTube video in hopes that your life will become more secure. And the more you try to become secure, the more security you'll want, and the less secure you'll become. Just like the more you try to impress a woman, the less likely you are to do so. Security doesn't exist. The I doesn't exist. The act of trying to be more secure implies that there is a separate I from a future I. So now you've made a race for yourself where the finish line is a mirage. What says, if I want to be secure, that is protected from the flux of life, I am wanting to be separate from life. Yet it is this very sense of separateness which makes me feel insecure. So what do we do? Do we abandon our pursuit of our dream relationship, saving for a house and securing our dream job? Do we browse more existentialcomics.com and scroll through r slash nihilism? Not necessarily. In his book, Out of Your Mind, what says, you can have this sensation of total unity with the cosmos without forgetting society's game rules with regard to you. In other words, it doesn't mean that you forget your address, phone number, and given name. You remember all that, and you play the game when necessary, but you always know that it's a game. When Hindu and Buddhist philosophers speak of detachment, it just means going with this whole thing and not resisting change. And if you do that, you can afford to go with it. You can afford to get mixed up in life and fall in love and get involved with all sorts of things. You can afford it if you know it's an illusion. Moving on to chapter six, the oh so marvelous moment. Consider that you are watching this video right now. And now I ask you, at this moment, who are you? This question is impossible to answer because you must stop and think about it. And when you started thinking about it, you are now thinking about who you were in the past based on your memory. But I ask who you are now. What says we try to adapt ourselves to the mysterious present by comparing it with the remembered past by naming and identifying it. Saying, I'm lonely, is an attempt to separate yourself from the experience of fear. It's your attempt to make fear objective and separate it from the I. This is fear trying to separate itself from fear. What says this is like fighting fire with fire? So by being open to an experience without resisting or naming it, you can eliminate the conflict between the I and current reality. Chapter seven, the transformation of life. Modern man is obsessed with trying to define reality. Trying to do so makes as much sense as this square. It's impossible. Here's why. To describe reality entails thinking and reality includes an experience where you are thinking about thinking. So to describe reality accurately, you'd have to describe thinking about thinking about thinking about thinking about thinking ad infinitum, which is an act of thinking itself, an act that is part of the endless chain of thinking about thinking. The chain is endless, so you can't possibly describe everything in the chain because it never ends. You can only say that it never ends, which is to affirm that you can't truly describe reality. 
Now, even if you disagree with this, and this makes no sense, your disagreement originates from thought. To have thought, you must think. And so to successfully describe reality or make a point that contributes to an accurate definition of reality, you'd have to separate yourself as the thinker from reality, but because you are part of reality, you can't step outside of it to describe it. Therefore, claiming to describe reality accurately is as wise as making this claim. To put it another way, defining reality is like trying to escape from quicksand. The more you struggle, the more you sink. But if you simply be with the quicksand, you prevent yourself from sinking. That's why Watts says that in order to understand reality, you have to be reality. All that means is acceptance of what is, not making judgments, and being aware in the present moment. A practical way to be aware is to listen to music, but understand the moment you think, I am listening to music, you are not listening. Chapter 8. Creative Morality Creative morality is the working of love in human relations. Moralists, according to Watts, assume that man is basically selfish with an intrinsic bias towards evil. The moralist tries to enforce rules for change by praising those for whom he believes is doing right and scolds those for whom he believes is doing wrong. But if Mr. Moralist wants Oscar to change his life, then he must assume that Oscar is free. Because if he's not free, then he has no freedom to change. If Oscar acts from the fear of a moralist's threats, then he is not making a free act. Therefore, change is impossible. A moralist may get Oscar to modify his behavior, but Watts says it won't change it in any essential respect. A moralist will cause one to run away from himself or run after himself. And behind all his acts, motive remains. So as long as there is motive, there is separation of the I from what is, and therefore no freedom. The most noble leaders, mentors, and gurus in history have never forced their teachings, but allowed their students the freedom to think about this purple elephant with a mohawk, or not think about it. In this video, you learn the backwards law, that belief clings and faith lets go, that our ability to conceive the past and future causes us tremendous pain. Symbols like words, science, and religion can't explain the universe, only joining the dance can. Listen to your body and allow your brain to be aware of present experience instead of resisting it. Security doesn't exist, but that doesn't mean you should abandon your life plans. Simply be aware that it's a cosmic game. Stop labeling and identifying things to eliminate the conflict between the I and your current reality. Defining reality is impossible, be reality. And invoking morality isn't effective by forcing it upon others, but by accepting their freedom.